Um, uh, it's, it's been so much fun. This past week has been great too. Uh, my dad's been able to be in town helping us out with, uh, with the girls. Man, I tell you what, we, get, we had Tobin and she was great, but man, two babies, it's hard. It's real hard. Y'all are like, yeah, I know. It's so hard. So it's been a great blessing having him uh, help us this week. But we're continuing our series. We, the summer we did uh, these studies on people in church history, but we're continuing our series called Believing, uh, based on the book of John. We've been going through the book of John, the gospel of John, one chapter at a time. And, and I really love this series. I love the book of John. It, it focuses so much, not on everything that Jesus did, but, but so much more about who Jesus is and his character and it, it's so exciting because what we're going to look at today, what we're going to look at this morning is, is something that is kind of not that spectacular to most of us. It's, it's a thing that we've, many of us are familiar with. If you've, if you've been involved in church for any length, you've, you've likely heard this wording. You've heard these phrases before. But, but when the disciples interacted with what Jesus was talking about, it was revolutionary. You see, we're, we're, we're a couple thousand years removed from what, what we're about to read, and, and it just seems kind of common to us, and we've actually even changed the words a little bit. But if you've ever heard this, walking with God, or the question, how long you been walking with the Lord, the, the walking, that all comes from this concept, this idea of abiding. And we're going to be talking about what it looks like to abide in Jesus. And, and when the disciples heard this, I'm telling you guys, it was, it was incredible for them. They had no idea that you could have this, this, you, this unity with Jesus. In the same way that we often think, oh yeah, I'm walking with Jesus. I've been walking with the Lord for 20 years. You know, it, it makes so much sense to us, but this is the first time it was shared with them. And it was just incredible. And so, really excited to get into that. We're going to be in John chapter 15, looking at verses 1 through 11. So John chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. In verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So I want to focus really quick on this. The very first thing Jesus says is, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. This, the, the, the vine imagery, this whole idea of this vine, it's a really common theme throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, Israel was often referred to as this, the vine that God was tending, the vine that God was taking care of. But more often than not, the people of Israel, he, um, as this vine connected to God, were often failing. They were choosing false gods. They were rejecting the truth. They were just kind of being led astray numerous times. And, and so this vine wasn't the wasn't really working. Um, we've had people like Moses and various prophets who were like, maybe this is the way to really be all the way connected. Or the law, if we just follow the law, if we do all these things, Jesus shows up and says, I am the true vine. In me, you can be united with God. And so this is an even more, more so of an encouraging thing because the original readers who would have read this, this letter, this, this, this gospel of John, were actually what's called the diaspora. They were actually spread out. The church had been struck. It had been a really difficult time when this was happening. And the church was actually spread out all over different areas. And so for them to find out that they don't have to be in Jerusalem, they don't have to be in one specific place, but just being connected to Jesus, it unites them with God, would have been so encouraging. It would have been so encouraging. And so we move forward into verse 2, um, where we see that every branch, this is what Jesus is talking about, because he says that his father is also the vine dresser. And so I want to I address, I want us to understand what, what he's talking about here. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. God is the one who's doing all of this, this work on the, the vine, gee, the whole vine deal. Um, I've, if you're anything like me, I've, I've heard this, this passage a couple times. I've read through it several times. And I've I've had the same problem. I've never fully been able to, to grasp the imagery of a grapevine or an olive vine. And so I went and bought one. <laughs> so I was going to have pictures up there because obviously not all of you can see this because um, it's tiny. But I went to this place called Ector's. Sir, have you ever heard of that place? It's like a nursery. Yeah, okay, cool. Sweet. So y'all probably, you know, that place is awesome. Um, I was, my dad and I went there. I was so impressed. I was like, there's no way this is a nursery. Like, it's huge. The parking lot's all brand. It's, it's nice. Anyway, five bucks got me a grapevine. 
I've, I've often thought, you know, like, why would Jesus want to be the vine? Like, vines are kind of flimsy and floppy, and the branch, you know, like a branch, I think of like a tree, like you got the trunk and this big hunk of wood, you know, like, shouldn't Jesus want to be, it never fully made sense to me. So I wanted to grab this, and I've, I've learned a lot about grapevines in the past 48 hours, y'all. So if you want your grapes to taste real good, see all these leaves, you got, you got to trim those back a little bit, because the leaves kind of block the sun from the, uh, the grapes, and the skin, is, is, it kind of loses a lot of its flavor. It misses out and gets some of the good flavors. So you got to cut those back, too. But more importantly, too, with the, with the fruit, if you want your get good grapes, the, the, these branches and stuff, they all kind of grow really long. I mean, it gets wild. You have to cut those back, because otherwise the plant spends all this energy growing that, and it doesn't actually get to the fruit. So you got to cut those back so it kind of grows to the fruit. But even more so than that, too, sometimes you got to actually, like, you've got, like, a little bundle. You can kind of see it right there. Get behind it. If the, your bundle gets too big, you got to, like, pull off the ones from the bottom, because what will happen is your fruit will start to get kind of this, like, fungi stuff or growing, because it, it doesn't have enough energy. So you got to stay focused right there. Now, if you can see, and you probably can't unless you've got binoculars with you because it's tiny, <laughs> this little guy right here, this part right here is that, is that branch. You know, all this is this vine, right? It's being, it's growing. And this, this branch is pretty much just what the, whatever the vine, whatever life the vine has, right? It's transmitted through the branch and then produces fruit. Like, the branch isn't actually doing much. The vine's the one carrying, doing, carrying all, the, all the roots, has the leaves, it's doing it. It's drawing everything and then putting it through the branch through us to make fruit. And so I really want to get this just to kind of give us a, a better visual because I know for me, I've, it just never really fully made sense. I'm like, vines seem so weak, you know, but we'll look at this more too. I'm going to pull this back. I'm totally going to run into that. Um, and so I love this idea of, of the God being the vine dresser. God's the one doing the pruning in our lives. He's the one doing all of the labor. You see, if you find yourself trying to do all of the pruning in your own life, it gets exhausting. There are, there are things that you just, I know I've tried, like, I, I gotta stop doing that thing. I just, I can't seem to stop that one habit or stop doing that one thing. I need a supernatural God to work in my life to change that. It's, it's, it's exhausting to work on that. And so this next verse, in verse three, we kind of see what Jesus says next to the disciples. And this, this verse seems, admittedly seems a little out of place because we're talking about the vine, you know, God's pruning these and the ones that are bearing fruit, he's gonna, you know, prune more so they get more fruit. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, here's why this kind of matters to you. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So when he's talking about you're, you're already clean, he's pretty much saying, guys, you have already understood who I am. You know that I am Jesus. You know what my mission is. You've been pruned. You're prepared. You're ready for this mission. You're ready to be sent out. Just to give you a little bit of background, this whole occasion is happening kind of leading up to Jesus' uh, death and, or crucifixion and death, right? They just finished having the Last Supper. All that's happening. Jesus is trying to encourage and prepare his disciples. He said on numerous occasions, I am leaving and you cannot come. I, I'm going to go to a place where you cannot come. And so he's trying to say, guys, it's, okay. it's going to be okay. Like, you can do this. You're ready. I, I think we could all agree that disciples are probably a little more pruned, a little more ready than maybe someone who's never met Jesus before. And so it, it begins to make sense. You know, Jesus is saying, you're ready, which then leads us to where we're going to spend a little more of our time, which is this question that is answered in verse four, which is the how. You know, and this is where I think we really begin to see kind of our own personal application in this is, okay, so we're, like, I get it, I'm the branch, you're the vine, my life comes through you. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I've been pruned, I know Jesus, his words are changing me, his words are teaching me, I'm, I'm prepared, so what do, I, what do I do? How do I actually do it? So verse four, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. We'll pick up on verse five in a second, but verse four, the very first word, abide. Some of your translations, I think the NIV might have the word remain. I want to focus on this word for a little bit of time because there's something really significant about it. So we're going to do a brief Greek grammar lesson. So yeah, just bear with me. We're going to hear a whole bunch of stuff, but I'm going to, it's going to make sense. Um, abide, remain, it all comes from the same Greek word. And the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And the word is meno. Meno. It's not that spectacular by itself. It pretty much means abide. But the, the, the way that Jesus used this word, it's called the, right, the aorist imperfect, or aorist imperative aspect. 
So in other words, it is a volitional uh, command without a specific duration of time. So bring it down some more. Jesus is saying that to abide this verb, to be involved in this verb, this is a thing that you willfully choose that is not a one-off singular event with ongoing effects. So let, let, let's get an example. The moment of salvation, the moment someone says, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior, that happens one time and it has effects that go on for the rest of their life. But that's a one-time thing. You don't keep redoing your salvation over and over and over. You do it one time with effects that go on to the future. You're, you have this relationship with God. But the interesting thing about this, this aorist imperative is that Jesus is saying that there is a responsibility on you to choose how often this verb will be done and for how long. It is up to you to decide how often are you going to abide. What's the frequency of this abiding in Jesus going to look like in your life? This isn't one thing you do one day and you're done. This isn't like a marathon. You run the race as hard as you can. You cross the finish line and you know what? Go to the massage table because you're done and just enjoy it. You know, this is Jesus saying, guys, this is a verb, an action that you're going to have to choose day in and day out. And I suggest you do it as much as you can. It's incredible sometimes when we, when we really go into this. And I absolutely love that. And in verse 5, we're going to see something really cool. I'm going to read that one now. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. I like this a lot because right here, if we can focus on, yeah, it's good there. If we can focus on it says, whoever abides in me, it is he that bears much fruit. And to not abide, not bear much fruit. It's pretty simple. Like Jesus makes this pretty straightforward. You're with me, you're gonna get lots of fruit. You're not with me, you got nothing. And so what I see there is I see a basic causal relationship. Cause, effect. With Jesus, fruit. No Jesus, no fruit. Or at least no fruit that matters. And so what, what I want us to see here is that Jesus is doing this work, that this is an internal change happening. Much like we talked about this, this, this fruit that we're going to have in our life, it's an internal thing happening. It's, it's the very life coming from the, coming from the vine into the branch to produce fruit. It is coming from the inside and going out. This is not some external uh, modification or some external addition just added on. There is, there is so much more to it than that. This is the type of change that we want. We want to see uh, internal transformation from the inside out because that is what is lasting. That is what is eternally significant. Let me, let me give you an example really quick. If I had a stick, we'll take like a branch and I put it right here. Let's say there's some dirt. I put the branch in, this, in, the, in the dirt and I say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow this into a tree. So I grab a bunch of leaves and I put it on top and I have my little branch and my pile of leaves. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow this bigger. So I get more leaves and, and literally it would be getting bigger if I got, you know, 10 pounds of leaves and put them on top. It is growing. It is in fact growing bigger. Now all of us would, nobody would be fooled if I said, look at my beautiful tree. Because we know that a tree comes from a seed which turns into a trunk, which grows from the inside out, which flourishes and life is coming up through those branches to form those leaves. That is a tree coming from the inside out. And we, we must be very wary of these external modifications, these external additions, because church, we can see growth. We can be the biggest church in Lakewood. People up here, maybe a new building entirely. We, can, we have the biggest church, but if we're just adding leaves to a stick, and this isn't Jesus working up through, and this isn't the work, this isn't the spiritual fruit brought through only by Jesus through the, through the vine. What are we doing? I've, I feel like I've seen this happen um, in my own life where I've tried to change things before Jesus, where I've tried to change things on my own. And I'm like, yeah, look at this. I got my new haircut. I got my new clothes. Man, I'm going to be a good man. I've been, I've been watching the, that, that one guy with the big smile. And I'm not, not Joel. I'm like one of those like, motivational guys. I'm always like, you can do it. And I'm like, I can do it. You know, it just, just give me a couple days, maybe a week at best, 
and I'll somehow be back to being that little stick wishing he was a tree. We gotta stop just adding leaves. We, we gotta see that. We wanna see spiritual fruit growing and it can only come from abiding in the vine. I want to say a few words about this fruit. Jesus talks about bearing fruit. In fact, if you were to read it, it's kind of a fun thing. You see those progressions. It says, you'll, you'll, the first, I think verse two, you'll bear fruit. And then it goes to bear much fruit. And then like even more fruit. It talks about this growth of fruit, right? But Jesus never actually specifies too much about the quantity of the fruit or the quality of the fruit. I think you can be saved you can be a follower of Jesus, but also, at the same time, not be fruitful. This is a tricky thing, right? I think, and this, this is a horrible example, but I think about Judas. Now, I, I don't know if he was saved or not, but I've heard so many people say to me, and I've talked to them about Jesus before, like, you know, Scott, if I could just see Jesus right now, if he just showed up right here in front of me, I'd believe. You know, or you know what, Scott, if he would do this thing for me, if he would, if he would do this miracle for me, I think that's what it would take for me. And I think about Judas, and I'm like, man, this guy like hit the Christian jackpot, right? He was there on the boat when Jesus walked on water. He was there watching the bread get multiplied to feed thousands. He was there for all of these miracles. And yet he was willing to trade all that for 30 pieces of silver. I don't, I don't think just seeing it's enough. You know, I think we can, I think we can be saved, but not always be fruitful and I think there's there's plenty of people in churches across our country that that are that are sitting there and they and they, they love God and they're they're there but they're just not willing to submit certain areas of their life to God you know um, I've heard one, one thing I hear a lot in Colorado is you know my, my church is the mountains that's that's my church I, I go up there and I, I I see God I agree absolutely 100% agree I love it. Man, this is the best place for it too. You can just see God's creation. But it is not a substitute for the corporate gathering of the believers. When you miss Sunday, you steal the opportunity for someone to be blessed by the spiritual giftings you have that you can pour into their lives and vice versa. We must be willing sometimes, to, This is. I think this is one of the easier ones, but not fun, is to submit and even sacrifice some of our recreation and I think what happens is when we sacrifice to God, we find that it's a delight. It takes a little bit of time. But I, I love playing disc golf and riding my bike and soccer, but this is where I want to be every Sunday. This is where I want to be. And I think about people, uh, I know a bunch of the, the, uh, the women here got to go to the Beth Moore conference. Um, there's a woman who I think is incredible fruit. Um, the work that this woman is doing, the, the, the Bible studies, the ministry she's had, the, the lives that have been touched by her submission to God is incredible. I can't imagine what, her, what dinner looks like with her. Um, I bet it's maybe really quick or maybe really fun, but then I bet she's back to studying. I, I don't know if she gets to watch uh, The Bachelorette in Paradise or all those shows. I don't know if she gets to stay up to date with all of those things. Um, I don't know if she has the, best, the newest magazines or the, even the best clothes. I think about Billy Graham and the sacrifices he made to speak to, I think the statistic is in his lifetime, he spoke to two billion people on the planet. Um, now you can do that from Twitter on your phone if you have a good enough tweet, right? But the sacrifices it took, all of our athletes, Olympic athletes, uh, we, had a, we had a guy, um, Derek Sundin, who was here, hopefully training, he's at that caliber. His life was, he had to sacrifice a lot to be at that level. I've often said, I wish I could sacrifice for God the way like an Olympic gymnast sacrifice, sacrifices for their Olympics. I mean, those girls, like Simone Biles, all them, it's crazy. Like she was like, she never went to prom, she never went to all these things. Like she, she missed all those things because she was willing to submit it all to this one thing. Now, if that's Jesus in your life, can you imagine the fruit that's gonna come? Can you imagine the spiritual breakthrough in your family, in your community? I mean, I want it. I want to see that. There's so many, I mean, I can give you a list. There's so many things I want to see God move in. 
and that quality of the fruit. I, I don't want us to get caught, I want to clarify what I said there. I don't want us to get caught in the mistake of, of comparing, you know, um, man, if I could just be like Beth Moore, if I could just, you know, do what, what he's doing up there on stage. I, I don't want us to get caught up in that because if you're going to compare yourself, compare yourself to Jesus and leave it at that, you know, that, that'll bring you some humility and it's tough. But don't get caught comparing your fruit, your quantity or your quality because here's what I think we need to do. Individually, between you and God, pray and consider how much has he equipped you with and what are you able to do? And we'll, we'll come back to this again, but are you, are you bearing fruit proportional to the, your capacity? God says he who's been given much, much is expected. I feel like God has given me the ability to read and learn quick. So I've tried to study. I've tried to spend time in school and get better and use that. And I, didn't, I don't get to watch some of the same shows everyone else gets to see. I'm way behind on, on all of my shows. And uh, I don't always get to do those things, but this is the thing that I want to do. This is, this is my delight. And, and so the question is, is, is the quality of your fruit, is it, is it there? Is it, is it really everything that you can do? Um... Going into verse six, I wanted to make this a separate point all by itself, the problem with fruitlessness. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, I want to clarify something really quick before we go further into this. This is not about to turn into hellfire, brimstone. You know, you're all going to hell if you don't have a grape on your, on your branch. You know, that's not what's about to happen here. Jesus is very literally speaking. Prior to this verse, he's been kind of doing this figurative language, this metaphor of, you know, uh, you're the branch, I'm the vine, kind of going back and forth. Right now, he is literally talking about a plant. The... These little guys right here, that branch. And if you can't see it, that further communicates my point. It's really thin. It's really tiny. It'll get bigger. And this guy can, you know, it'll be awesome. But they're all, the branches are always going to be kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're there for the fruit. Should a branch not bear any fruit, it, it dries up, withers, falls off. The, the wood itself, because it is, you know, it's, it's like a tree, it's wood. It's not really good for anything. It's too small to build anything good. It's too brittle to tie and, and do any kind of knot stuff with it. It's really not good for anything except to maybe be thrown in the fire to keep you warm or cook your bread. It really has just one purpose and that's to have fruit. Does it have the fruit? Does it not? If it doesn't, get rid of it because it's just going to fall to the ground. Let's pick it up. There's no other purpose. And this is the point Jesus is making. Such is the same for the Christian. We have one major role, and it's to bear fruit for God. What that looks like can be really interesting. It can be really unique to each of us, and i make sure I get this. Um, there's this song written by uh, a guy named Lecrae, and I, I like him a lot. He has, he's, a, he's a rapper, he's a Christian guy, and the opening, one of the opening lyrics of his song is, Lord, kill me if I don't preach the gospel. And I, I mean, I like the song, but that one part, um, and Marianne will say the same thing, I kind of like, mm, that's a crazy thing to pray. That is a crazy and radical thing to pray. Lord, kill me if I don't preach the gospel. Because like the branch, what good are we? What good is this Christian life? If you're willing to, if you're going to sacrifice all these things, give up your Sundays, some of, your, some of us even miss football games because we're here, and you're giving up all these different things so you can be here, what is the point of it all if we're not going to bear spiritual fruit that lasts in eternity? This whole thing we're doing becomes almost pointless. The Christian has these two has this role to bear fruit. And, and I, want to, I want to be specific too. I love this thing, this situation. I read this, uh, a guy named Martin Luther, if you're familiar with him, dude who was way back in, uh, I think, Germany. And some stuff was going on with the church and, and he was preaching and this guy comes up to him and he's like, hey, I just, I just decided to, to give my life to Jesus for him to be my Lord and my Savior. He's like, I'm a shoe cobbler. Should I... Should I quit my job now and become like a monk and like a, like a pastor like you? 
And Martin Luther says, no, no, that's, that's ridiculous. Like, you don't have to, to serve God. You don't have to bear fruit by becoming this. He's like, nor do you need to put little gold crosses on every one of the shoes you make. Just make great shoes. Sacrifice. Be committed. Make excellent shoes. These things honor God. Do the work as you were doing it unto the Lord. This is honorable. We don't have to all quit our jobs and become monks and aesthetics who just go off in the desert and pray and don't talk to anybody. In fact, God doesn't want that. Jesus says that we, that the, the kingdom of heaven is like, is like the wheat germ, that, like, like yeast that you put into dough and it works its way through everything. It's not supposed to be, you know, workplace, school, community, rec center. It's supposed to be like church, like Jesus fit into every single one of those. We're like a germ trying to infect everything. We're not supposed to be a separate little category. So no, don't, don't go quit your job. Continue to, to pour into the lives of kids as a teacher. Continue to, to be honorable in your, in, your, in your position as you deal with maybe numbers and accounts and, and statistics and all the different things. Uh, continue to show up on time and, and do the best you can, even if your boss is crazy. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that about my boss. <laughs> I can see how that might look bad. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Man, though. I always show up late. I need to work on that too. Um, all right, let me get back on track. But continue to, to honor God in these things. And it's incredible. It's, it's absolutely incredible because the message that sends to people is here is a, here's a person who's doing this, this caliber, this, this degree of work. And they say they're doing it because they want to do it as if they were doing it unto God. That's a powerful testimony. I think there's something more deadly, though, than pursuing the world. You know, um, actually, Dakota, you put the verse on the back from Matthew, I think. In Matthew 16, I think I have it on here, it says that, uh, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You know, like, we can pursue everything, we can get it all, but, but what gain is, I think there's something still even more dangerous than allowing ourselves to get caught up in and all these other things. And it's the passive Christian. It's the, it's the willingness to say, I'm not concerned about that. I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. I'm just gonna let that happen. One of the, one of the best examples I see in scripture starts very, very early on. Um, unfortunately, it's Adam. As Eve stood there being lied to, being deceived by this serpent. Excuse me. If you, if you read in scripture, you break it down, you'll see that Adam was standing right next to her, letting it happen. Allowing his wife to be fed lies. Allowing his wife <clears throat> to be assaulted by deception and falsehood. He didn't protect her. He didn't say, stay away. I, I heard about this dude, he's bad. He didn't stop her from even getting close to the tree. Like, honey, we, we probably shouldn't be going that way. Let's just stay away. He just, you know, sure. Wherever you want, wife. I don't want to rock the boat. Let's just let it happen. And then even worse, you know, ladies first. <laughs> tell me what, tell me taste. And then he takes his turn, right? We cannot sit back and just let these things happen. There's a really convicting quote from Charles Spurgeon, a, a preacher of old in England. And it's one that makes me uncomfortable. And he says that every Christian, every Christian is a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian's a missionary or an imposter. And that, that kind of messes with me a little bit because I don't feel like I'm always the best missionary. Sometimes I'm really tired. Sometimes I don't want to share my mac and cheese. I just want to eat by myself and I don't want to talk to anybody. It's hard. It's real hard. But here's the best part. And we're going to have to go a little faster. <laughs> Verses 7 through 11. We're going to see these three promises for the disciples. These three promises. I'm going to call it pledge. Pledge because the letters are P-L-J, which sounds like pledge. Pledge. You're going to remember it because it sounds funny. Pledge. P-L-J. And I want you to remember these. 
It's almost like a pledge to us. In verse 7, here's where it starts. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Well, shoot, I've been following the, uh, the Powerball as of late and I don't think anybody won last night. So like 600 mil, y'all, like I'll tell you what I'm praying for. Some of you are like, oh shoot, he's praying for it too, dang it. No, that's not quite what he's talking about here, right? Because here's what Jesus does with all of these promises. They, you know how they have those books, like the promises of, of God? Well, they often come with these little, little criteria things and they can feel exclusive, but I really think they're more inclusive. They're inviting you into a deeper relationship with God. And here's, here's what it looks like. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. He's inviting us to allow his words, the teaching of Jesus to abide in us because in those words is the power of God, the transformative work. It is the inside out change that we were talking about with our plant. Coming from the inside, from the vine into the branch, changing your heart, changing your desires, changing your will and conforming it to the will of God. So what happens is the desires you pray are the desires that God has. You're desiring the same desires that God desires. You become such an effective, your prayers become incredibly effective because you're now praying in the will of God. If you pray something that God wants, well, that's a pretty good it's gonna happen. But we're changed to want these things. You see, I, I feel like I spend most of my time praying to God, here's what I want. You know, maybe 60%, like, God, I want this, I want this, I want this. And then, like, maybe 30% saying, God, why didn't you give me that? And the 10% saying, oh, I get it. You know, sometimes we kind of pull up to God at, like, the McDonald's drive through you know. Like, I'll take two of the blessings, extra um, health and wellness, and, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, hold, hold the repentance. I want to deal with that. You know, like, like, we just kind of, like, pick and choose instead of coming to him, listening Maybe even asking the question, Lord, what would you have me do today? How might I glorify your name today? How can I lead my family for you today? How can I be a better son, daughter? Seeking his leadership. Those prayers don't come as quick. But what an awesome promise what you pray will come true. And how, oh man, I'd love to always be praying what God wants because that means that my desires have changed. My, everything I want has changed. It's an incredible piece of encouragement. And that's our P of our pledge. Our next one's L. So we're going down to L, which is love. And we catch this one in verse nine. Uh, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Hopefully you caught it that time. Did you catch that little invitation? If you keep my commandments, live like me. Follow in my steps and you will experience a divine supernatural love that is only known between God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. It is a perfect love, a perfect love that casts out all fear, a perfect love that is patient, a perfect love that is unconditional. Y'all, this is waiting for you and this is just the beginning. What an encouragement for the disciples who are getting ready to see Jesus leave and they're being told what you pray will come true. What you, the, the way that you'll be loved, you, you will feel it beyond your wildest dreams. To know that I'm cared about, to know that someone wants to, wants to, wants to hear about my day and wants to, wants to help me. I mean, that's, that's just powerful when I, when I get that from my wife. How much more is it when we get that from the king of the universe and what that love can do because that love changes hearts. And the last one, pledge, right? P is our prayer. L is our love. J is our joy. Last verse, pledge. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I love that he adds this because I, I love like being happy and feeling great. And I love that Jesus is like, I'm gonna put my joy in you. And here's something super, super cool. Joy is, I, I love the distinction, maybe y'all have heard this before, that joy and happiness aren't the same, that, that happiness can be circumstantial. Well, here's, here's, a, here's a quick way to say it. I love this. Happiness is a choice and joy is a fact. 
happiness is a choice because things can go horrible and you can still choose to be happy. You, know, you can try, you know, you can have things go horrible that just don't feel good, but you have to, you have to choose to be happy. The, the fact, the joy is a fact is because joy is the reality. Joy is the truth that your identity is in Christ, that you are loved, that you matter, that through the power of Christ, you can see transformation. You can see renewal. You can find redemption. You can find revival. That is a fact and that is the origin, the epicenter of joy. It is unwavering. It is um, unshakable. It is unmovable because it is a fact. It cannot be changed. It's something you know. You don't have to feel it. But man, it does have a, a certain feeling to it though. Because when you have a truth like that, it supports you in the winds and the waves. It holds you up. And I love it because Jesus is saying, hey guys, this is gonna be a good time. It's gonna be a good ride following me, being my disciple, what's, what's coming next, it's going to be a good ride. It's going to be worth it. When we recognize that Jesus is our vine and that he's, he's working through us, it, it helps us understand the balance of our life. We begin to see where we need to spend our time. Some things are just not fun. I've yet to enjoy doing my taxes and I, I try to you know, do it the right way so I'm honoring God still because, you know, all the numbers and it's messy. I, I let the computer do it. And some things just aren't fun. But there is, there needs to be a balance because there are certain things in our life that will have eternal significance and there are some things in our life that just, just don't. Some things in our life we just have to do. Waiting in traffic, just have to do that. Your hours are going to be spent there. But are you waiting in traffic to go to a job that you know has become more of a priority to you than God? Because then you begin to have the balance tipped. When we allow ourselves to, to let other things supplant the place that God needs to be, we've tipped the balance. When we are abiding in Christ, only then can we do the work that bears fruit that actually matters. Everything else is just a drop in the ocean. I want us to ask ourselves these three questions and we're going to be done. And I want you real quick, everyone, uh, if you have a pen in front of you, grab a pen. If you have your phone, I want you to, I want you to see this in front of you. Um, take out your phone and type it if you need to. If you have a pen or a pencil, write it. Uh, if you have neither of those things, uh, really listen. Um, Now's the time when you can, like, you can wake up, you know, after I'm almost done. Um, you can wake up again. I believe at least one of these three questions God's going to reveal to you. He's going to, he's going to put on your heart. One of these three questions is going to mean something to you, and I want you to kind of think through it. The first one, am I in the vine? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you still thinking about it? Which is totally great. I spent a year and a half trying to figure it out and get to a place where I'm like, okay, I get this. I'm, I'm in stepping in faith. I, it makes sense. I get it. I get it. And if, if that's you today, I'm so happy you're here. This does not need to be a sanctuary for the saints, but a better refuge for the, the, the loved, the people who, I want to be a place where, where God loves us, where we love each other. Am I in the vine? Question number two, am I abiding in Jesus? Remember, this is a daily decision. There are days when I can feel myself sometimes not abiding. And I just feel gray. I feel kind of empty. Like I can't, like, a, like all the, 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 the power and the things I'm able to come up with just aren't working. It's just not going right. I'm just running dragged. And if I'm not abiding, what's getting in the way? Is there some sin I've invited? Have I made something more important? And if you are abiding, keep it up. And how can you, how can you use that and, and infect everyone else, like the, like the germ, right? Or this germ, how can you infect other people to help them abide? Last question. Am I bearing fruit? You're, you're in the vine. You're abiding. Are you seeing fruit? If not, is it because God wants you in a season where you can just continue trusting him and know that it's gonna come? He just, wants, he just wants you to be in this period where you're having to trust and you're not seeing anything, but you have faith to know it's gonna come. Maybe that's where you are. Or is there some particular reason why there's no fruit? Have you not maybe made that, that sacrifice? Have you not maybe submitted that one thing? When we, 
when we abide in the vine, we, we get that pledge, y'all. Prayer, uh, we get the, the, the incredible prayer. We get these, this divine love, this supernatural love, and we get this immaculate joy. That, th- these are the promises for the disciples. And if, if you're here this morning, you're still kind of thinking about everything. This is just the beginning of your life with Christ. Should you make a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior? This is just the beginning. It's so exciting. It's made all the difference in my life. And I know it will do the same for you. It won't be easy. It'll probably hurt a little bit. No one likes to be pruned, but it helps us grow. And I trust the God doing the pruning. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this, this truth, this, this message that Jesus shared. For the first time, we realize that there is a way we can be fully united with him, oh Lord. God, that as we choose daily to abide, Lord, through your power, you indwell within us as we're changed by your word, as we're changed by obedience. Your love for us completely transforms us from the inside out, like a vine pouring its life through the branch to create fruit. God, we want this in our life so bad. Lord, speak louder so that we may hear you. Come come closer that we may feel you and draw us deeper that we may know you better. God, we want to be missionaries. In Jesus' name, amen.